All right, everybody. Uh, when we get started here, we don't want to uh, delay everybody. And first off, I want to say thank you for joining us today at CRISPR Office Hours. We're excited. This is the second session that we're having. And just to reiterate why we're here, why we're doing this, this is a weekly hour dedicated to the genome engineering community to help all of us navigate these turbulent and challenging times. Our goal is to let the community hear from other genome engineers, researchers, scientists, and life science professionals about understanding and tackling the COVID-19 pandemic and the impact it's having on all of us and how we can get through this together. My name is Aditya Vempati, and I'm the VP of Marketing at Synthigo. I'm really excited about what we're gonna talk about today during office hours with my host, Kevin Holden, and guest panelists. Hi everyone, I'm Kevin Holden, Head of Science at Synthigo. So last week, we had a pretty great introduction show, which we were joined by Hamid Kadnani of Limus Group, where he presented his company's research on the autonomy, autonomy of disruption, how coronavirus will disrupt the scientific research community. Yeah, did you want to go ahead and uh, show that, uh, that slide? Yeah. OK, great, cool. So um, yeah, we, we learned some great insights from uh, Hamid's talk uh, last week, and we wanted to continue to explore uh, the different phases of this model. Um, so last week we touched on um, the phase that he called the initial shock. And um, this week we're gonna discuss this period called the golden interim, um, which actually leads into our title today, um, which is how genome engineering labs adapt and assist during the COVID-19 crisis. So as we get started, I want to do a few housekeeping items, make sure everyone um, understands. Uh, we'll be recording the CRISPR office hours. So that'll be available for everybody once they want to watch this after we're done recording. And then also we want to make this interactive session. We want to make sure that you get to ask the questions you want. Just use the chat window, post your questions, and we'll get to them. And we may not be able to get to all of them. We apologize uh, beforehand but we will respond to as many as we can. So please don't be offended if we don't get to your questions. And also the other thing is we do want, again, people to be interactive and participate. And also we are always looking for hosts for future CRISPR hours. So if you would like to be a host, don't hesitate to email me, av at synthgo.com. And as we're getting on with this, uh, Kevin, do you wanna take a moment to introduce our panelists? Uh, yeah, certainly. Thanks, Aditya. Um, so, um, first of all, um, we're really excited to um, be joined today by um, a couple of scientists. We have um, uh, first uh, Jared Carlson Stevermer, who is a, um, a lead cell biologist at Synthigo in our research group. Um, and uh, then we are also uh, joined by Shravats uh, Venkatramaram, <laughs> let you pronounce that better than I can, um, who is a postdoctoral researcher in the lab of Stephen Floor at UCSF. And so with that, we wanted to start off real quick with a little uh, fun poll question we had. Um, you know, keep everyone in the mood of just, you know, we all understand that this is trying times. And one of the questions we had is, what distracts you the most when working from home? Um, if the panelists want to answer one, we have taking care of pets, taking care of the kids, watching Netflix, watching my weight, keeping busy with work or keeping my sanity. Srivats, uh, Jared, what do you guys feel on Kevin? I'm gonna I think go Srivats ahead. may be uh, muted. I'm, uh, there we go. Yep, go there you go. Um, I think it's a combination of keeping busy with work and uh, taking care of the my, my extremely needy cat all the time. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Although he's gone from the phase of being really happy that I'm home all the time to um, being really annoyed with me and wanting me to go back to work. So that might not last. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would say it's the same thing. It's, we have a one-year-old French bulldog that I actually ended up coming into the office today because otherwise she'd be scratching at the door trying to jump into my, trying to jump into my lap. Um, I think the other thing that distracts me too much at home is the fact that I can just go up and get coffee whenever I need to and not be in the lab anymore. And so then I get very, very jittery by the end of the day. Um, I would say for me, it's, um, it's probably a combination of taking care of pets. I also have a cat who is now starting to look at me like, why are you here all the time? Um, and then watching my weight, um, just so easy to get up and snack all the time when you're working from home. 
So I think when we all get through with this thing, it's uh, everyone's going to be left with uh, the quarantine 15. That's what I'm going to call it. The, the quarantine 15, that's a good one. Uh, for me, I think it's definitely keeping my sanity and uh, watching my weight. Those are definitely both the ones that I probably adhere to more than anything else. So looks like cool. we have a couple. looks like we have a couple of um, uh, answers from the audience too. I don't know if you want to read those. Yeah, let's uh, take a look at them. I think one of the uh, funny ones, uh, Laura Lambert, she says too, taking care of the kids. Betty, six, keeping my sanity. And uh, Lynn Healy, uh, number five, keeping busy with work. All right. Cool. With that, I think uh, let's get started here. Um, Kevin, you want to start taking it away with our first focus, which is uh, about this wonderful paper and uh, that Srivats was involved in. Yeah, first actually, uh, would you mind going to the, the slide to show the, the graph again? Thank you. Yeah. All right, so um, Shravats and, and Jared, thanks very much for uh, taking the time to join us today. Um, I just thought briefly, um, before we go into our discussion, uh, we'd reintroduce what this golden interim period was for those who weren't with us last week. Um, so according to the model that, um, that Hamid presented right. to us last week uh, from the Linus group, um, which was based on a survey of more than a thousand scientists, after you go through this initial shock phase, um, the, the industry, uh, whether it's academics or um, uh, biotechnology, uh, will enter this golden interim phase. And so um, the survey respondents um, to, to the survey estimated that this phase will, will last them about three to six months. Um, and uh, it really, it's kind of aligned with when we see the peak levels of infection uh, for coronavirus, and then uh, we move into a subsequent decline. So although um, a lot of the respondents claim that they're going to be really productive during this interim period, um, activities are obviously going to be um, different during this time than business as usual. Um, so um, the, what came out of uh, the survey that Hamid showed was that many of the respondents are planning uh, to do writing, to analyze data, and also um, uh, think about the, the future work that they're going to do. So um, another thing to consider is that um, labs can also utilize their expertise during this time, um, maybe to help contribute towards therapies for the virus or understanding its biology. Um, so um, I know uh, uh, Jared and Shravats, I know both of you are actually taking part in, in such an effort, but before we get into that, um, maybe uh, you can tell us um, how your day-to-day -day work has changed since shelter in place has come in. Um, maybe Shravats, let's start with you. Can you tell us a bit about um, your research work first, where you work, and then how things, how things have changed for you? Yeah, sure. Um, so just to reintroduce myself, my name is Srivats Venkatramanan. Um, just call me Srivats. Uh, the second part is probably too hard. Uh, I, I am currently a postdoc at the University of California, San Francisco in the lab of Dr. Stephen Floor. And I um, typically, in non-COVID times, work on mRNA translation in the cell, how it's controlled, and how the cell responds to different stresses. Um, and when I joined the Floor Lab two years ago, I was really interested in how the cell decides how to allocate its internal resources and how that decision-making process changes depending on the stresses the cell experiences. I'm primarily a wet lab biologist. I'm an experimentalist. I do do a bit of bioinformatics, but I'm primarily wet lab driven. Um, and obviously that is no longer an option because my, my immediate work is not considered to be essential to the COVID response and therefore I am uh, required to shelter in place, which I'm okay with. Um, but I found after the initial couple of weeks, the initial shock of just not knowing what to do with myself, I think uh, we've settled into kind of a, a period where I'm finding things to do. I'm reading a lot. Uh, reanalyzing a lot of the data that I've generated in the past, as well as other people's data, talking to um, a more diverse group of scientists that I have the had the opportunity to do in the past, because, you know, I'm sitting at home all the time, might as well hop onto a Zoom with someone. And it's the, the barrier of activation to chatting with people is lower. Um, my lab is handling things in more or less similar ways. Um, we are still in constant communication with each other we, via our lab Slack, and we still have weekly lab meetings. Uh, Steven, our PI, is available for one-on-one -on -one meetings or smaller group meetings at, you know, based on scheduling. He has 
um, his own schedule to go out with, of course. There's no ongoing experiments in the lab at the moment, uh, actual benchtop experiments, but we are all managing to keep ourselves occupied, busy, and productive in some way, shape, or form. So it's, it's good. It's not bad. Yeah, that's great. That's great to hear. Um, Jared, do you want to tell us a little bit about um, how things, uh, what you do at Synthigo and also how um, the work has changed for you at, at Synthigo as a scientist? Yeah, certainly. Uh, so like Kevin mentioned, my name is Jared Carlson Stevemer. I'm a lead scientist in the research and development group here at Synthigo. Um, a lot of what our R&D group does is we really span the gamut of everything and anything that is genome editing. And so that includes, you know, the creation of new technologies that help make genome editing easier, more accessible, or more successful, um, more accessible to everybody else. Um, and how can we make it more predictable? How can we make it so that every single gene editing experiment that you have, we can come up with an outcome an a priori outcome so that your research isn't actually being held up by that. Um, so like I mentioned, that could be technologies, that could be screenings, that could be testing a large number of guides, um, doing all these sort of things at high throughput. Um, so kind of like what Kevin mentioned is we, we definitely had an initial shock as everything was, as all these shelter in places were going on, um, you know, things were transitioning, we were moving to, are we going to work from home? How do we keep experiments going? Um, which experiments are the ones that we actually need to keep going and how is that, I mean, for the biologists in here, how do we keep cells alive at points where if we need to do an experiment, we can. Um, and we really have kind of reached this golden interim period. Um, as, a, as a lab, we've kind of implemented new policies that are you know, very successful in keeping people safe and trying to keep people so that they can maintain their social distancing. Um, Previously, I'm sure a lot of you also know, is that we used to have, we had more people than we actually had BSCs, that we had hoods that we could work in. Um, and so that would create a little bit of lock, or lock, backlog. Um, what we've done now is actually we have a set number of people that we can only have in lab at a time. So you actually have to schedule yourself and based off of the, you know, based off that period of time is how long you can be in lab. And so it really makes you try to think about experiments that you can do um, and think about experiments that you can do in that time frame. Um, the other, you know, people are only in maybe two or three days a week now, um, just based off of their experimental load. And so you really have to try to make the most of that time. And it's actually forcing you to be more productive than you would just be kicking around or um, coming in and then figuring out, oh, I could probably do that this afternoon or anything else like that. Um, I think the really good, the really interesting thing about Synthigo is that we have a research team that is very, very dedicated to keeping a lot of their projects going and are very able to pivot and try to address a lot of these COVID problems that, you know, maybe academic labs or labs that are shut down, um, that we can serve as a resource for them, or we can serve as kind of a sounding board of, hey, here's a whole bunch of different things that are going on, what might work, what might not work, and really start to put that into action. Um, so yeah, we've, we've definitely started to become accustomed to a little bit of the, the golden interim period where we're, we're really starting to ramp back up. Cool, Jared. Thank you uh, for that. So I want to ask a question to all you guys uh, real quick. And one of the questions I had was, how are you handling not being constantly productive? Uh, I'll take that one. Um, it's, I would say it's not so much as not being constantly productive, but being productive in different ways. I mean, you can see kind of here in the golden interim that this is a period of writing analysis and planning. Um, we have a new manuscript that's hopefully going out in the, in the near future um, that we, about new CRISPR technologies and way to control it, um, but that we're actually able to take the time to really think about what do we want to write, how do we want to write this, and how can we present the data in the way that'd be the most informative. Um, and this is something that with a day-to-day -day research or trying to push technology forward all the time, um, we wouldn't really be able to do. And so we're able to shift that production into other further, um, you know, other, other ways of being productive. If I may uh, weigh in there, um, I want to mention that, that the graph is, is great, but it's also an average function. Different individuals and different organizations will work through that graph at different paces, depending on the constraints and challenges that they face. And the way we're dealing with it is honestly giving ourselves permission to 
not be productive if that's you know if that's the need of the day if that's the need of the the week even if um this is an unforeseen situation this is kind of a uh, a moment that is that has no precedent so if you need the time to just sit on your couch and deal with it i think you take the time to sit on your couch and deal with it you take things at your at your own pace and um only mildly worry about productivity as opposed to you know be still constantly a part of the rat race i would oh yeah guess, okay cool i guess yeah. i would stress do what do what you need to do to take care of your own physical and mental health yeah i think that's definitely a definitely a valid point Shravats. um I, I think maybe um uh just just to give some context um things are a little different for um us at synthego just because um our production and manufacturing um is, is still up and running albeit um definitely changed a little bit, a lot more PPE and things like this in place. But, um, you know, we've uh, essentially been asked to continue uh, uh, production and manufacturing as we're providing reagents and services to, to labs that maybe couldn't normally um, uh, uh, keep operating. So, um, but yeah, you, you're definitely right. That's, um, that's, a, that's a really um, a critical point. Um, okay, so um, I th thanks for answering those questions. Um, I, I mentioned earlier that, you know, now is, is really kind of this amazing time, right, for a lot of really smart people and research groups to kind of band together and try to pull resources to better understand um, the, the pathogenesis, for example, of SARS-CoV-2 or um, develop uh, potential therapies or diagnostics and so forth. Um, and uh, on that note, Shavats, I know you were recently involved in um, a really exceptionally interesting submission to the BioArchive. Um, can you tell us um, a little bit more about this project, um, how you came to be involved and and what you think it can be uh, useful for? Yeah, of course. Um, do you have the slides? Yeah, so um, I wanna mention that this, the project that Kevin is referring to was uh, spearheaded by the Krogan Lab in, at UCSF and they've done really spectacular work in this. And, like, and, and a lot of the people, including myself, um, were involved kind of peripherally after they did the bulk of the experimentation. But um, what, what Nevin's lab essentially did was express almost all of the proteins um, that, are have, that, that are made by the SARS-CoV-2 virus in HEC-293 cells and is using the resources and tools that they've developed in the lab over, their, over the past um, few years come up with a list of cellular interactors for all of these proteins. And what you can see on the screen now is that map that they generated. Um, if this was an exceptional piece of work, but this by itself is not um, terribly useful. You now have a list of proteins. Uh, what are you gonna do with that? And this is where this work kind of diverts from your typical academic manuscript. Uh, now typically, the lab would pick a few of these interactors that they deemed interesting and uh, deep dive into them, break up the mechanisms and break, uh, tease apart the mechanisms and potentially come up with further insights. Um, exceptional times require exceptional measures though. And what the Krogan lab did at this point was with much to their credit is more or less crowdsource the expertise that already exists at UCSF. They put this map out to pretty much everyone at UCSF and um, essentially solicited expertise. And that's where kind of the floor lab comes in. Um, and I joined Stevens lab uh, two, a little over two years ago. I was interested in these cellular structures called cell stress granules, which are formed when the cell expresses, the cell experiences any kind of stress whatsoever. They're little, little clusters of RNAs and proteins that essentially serve as triage wards for the cell. And if you could move to the next slide. Uh, coincidentally, the Krogan lab found that one of the proteins, one of the structural proteins of SARS-CoV-2, the N protein of the nucleic acid protein, interacts with a couple of core components of the stress granule, which you can see at the bottom here, G3VP1 and G3VP2, as well as um, a couple of proteins that regulate the formation of these granules negatively. So CSNK2A and 2B are members of a casein kinase complex that negatively regulate the formation of these stress granules. And so um, 
I, I'm not exactly sure of what the channels were, but if they reached out to Steven, who reached down, reached back down to uh, us in the lab, and then we came up with a potential model for how this might be working and identified um, potential therapeutic interventions that might be possible. And of course, we don't know if these therapeutic interventions will work yet. Um, there's just a rationalized, a rationalizable mechanism that they might be acting through. And these are currently uh, being tested on cells. I should, and I should make that point. These are currently being tested on cells. Um, could you play that video? I guess not. Let's see if we, <laughs> if we can. Uh, no, we're, 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 we're having some issues with the video. Let me try and uh, get that going. You can continue, Srivats. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's how that's how this. So that was me. That was me and our lab with the stress granules. And um, another part of the lab was actually uh, it, where I actually took on the effort of focusing on the top half of this figure here, the LARP1 and assist and poly A binding proteins and associated components of the transition machinery. But this happened all across the board. You saw that huge map in the previous slide. What the Krogan lab essentially did was identify people who have the necessary, have the requisite expertise to contribute and reach out to them. And we all got together in kind of this immense Slack group that now encompasses about um, I don't know, maybe 250 to 300 people and um, all got together and wrote this manuscript in essentially under a week, which if you know how academic publishing works is a Herculean effort. Um, and it's currently under, currently under review at a journal, but that's not the important point. The important point was getting this data out there so that other researchers and the scientific community and the COVID response community um, could potentially use it, right? The speed was of the essence here. Um, I think you can play I, that, your video now if you want to. Oh, yeah. I just wanted this. So this is a video taken by a grad student in the floor lab, Jose. I just wanted to show you what stress granules look like because they're really cool. Um, in purple here is the component protein of the granule. And when you induce the granule formation, you see how they just like condense into these droplets in the, inside, the, inside the cytoplasm. Uh, these droplets essentially have almost all of the RNA in the cell, all of the messenger RNA in the cell, and a few proteins. Um, and the function of these granules is when the cell experiences any sort of stress, it essentially stops all transition, compresses all of these RNAs into this granule, and then performs triaging. All right, how do I deal with this stress? What do I need to do? Do I need to translate all of my proteins? Do I need to translate some of my proteins? Do I need to die uh, in order to protect the tissue? And while it makes this decision, these RNAs are kind of compressed in these granules. They're really cool structures, and this is kind of what I do on a daily basis under non COVID conditions. And just coincidentally, the proteins that are involved in the granule formation, what you're seeing in purple here, is actually G3P1. Um, just happened to be impacted by this virus. So that was that was kind of cool. Um, not just this virus, pretty much all viruses affect granules in some way, shape or form. So if you could move to the next slide, Aditya. Sure. sure. Um, yeah, so kind of the model we produced, so the virus seems to inhibit granule formation. And granules are typically antiviral. Um, so kind of the model we produced was potentially testing this drug called Selmetasertib, which is already in phase three trials for a different um, application that inhibits this negative regulator of granules that also associates with the N protein and um, thereby promoting granule formation or directly, formating, directly promoting granule formation through other drugs that have been known to do. So the idea being, if you can push granule formation, um, you could potentially inhibit the replication cycle of the virus in cells. This is of course, just one part of this project. This effort was reproduced for different parts of that protein interactome for every viral protein all across UCSF. And all of that effort came together into this paper that you're referencing. And I, uh, again, want to give a shout out to the people who coordinated this, because if you have 
if you've ever tried coordinating about a hundred academic researchers, it's worse than herding cats. It's, I, I, I have no, you have no idea how much admiration I have for these people. Um, but this was a spectacular piece of work, but it of course leaves a lot of work that remains to be done. We, you know, we'd of course like to go into the mechanisms of all of these individual interactions and dissect them and, but all of that is, some of that is work that's going on. The, 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 the immediate testing of the candidate molecules against the virus. That's of course going on in certain labs at UCSF, but the mechanistic work is currently uh, on hold because of the shutter in place orders. Because of course that is something that's a little more long-term, but we are certainly considering ideas um, to dissect these mechanisms, a lot of which involve a lot of gene editing workflows. So. That's where we are at. Hey, hey Sharad, uh, I had a, yeah. I had a question. Um, was there, yeah. as, as you went through this, this work and building um, this mm -hmm. diagram out, were, were there parts of this network which kind of surprised you in terms of like the context of protein-protein uh, interactions that you um, see it with other viruses? Um, yes, so one thing that surprised us was that the interactor, the interactor of the N protein, and I'm gonna stick with the N protein because that was what we did a deep, by V I mean me and the floral lab did a deep dive on. Um, the interactor of the N protein, which is the nuclear capsid, which is the, um, the structural protein that coats the viral genome is pretty well conserved across not just uh, coronavirus, other coronaviruses like SARS-CoV-2 and SARS, but also viruses that are as far apart from these as like the influenza viruses. So um, your regular flu also has a nucleocapsid protein, which also seems to interact with very similar, um, very similar cellular components as the SARS-CoV-2 N protein. So that was a little surprising, but also really cool because it might suggest that there's common vulnerabilities that could potentially be exploited in the future as more broad range treatments against these viruses. And then uh, um, I also wanted to just ask um, you, those incredible number of scientists working on this paper, like you mentioned, and really getting all those people coordinated is, is like you said, quite an effort. Um, are there still groups um, associated with this work that are continuing to, to, to do this work? Uh, yes, so after, well, during and after the uh, publication of this paper, the community that was involved in it, the academic community that was involved in it coalesced into this group that we titled QCRG because everything needs an acronym at UCSF. Um, and then kind of broke off into subgroups based on different specializations. And um, a lot of these, some of these specializations involve directly testing the molecules that were identified here. Some of them involve, um, well, there's, there's, there's a group of people who are also essentially sending out these plasmids and these constructs to other um, labs around the country and the world. And these groups are still working. And I want to emphasize, I want to mention the group that's actually working on a lot of testing of the molecules. Um, so a lot of these groups are actually working. Um, a lot of the groups that are focusing on the more mechanistic aspects of the work are either working from home, you can do some structural predictions, a lot of bioinformatic analyses from home, um, or going into lab on the odd occasion in a case-by-case -case basis. There is no, there is no one size fits all here. And eventually when we come out of this period, we think we'll slowly start going back to lab uh, on a case-by-case -case basis again. And then we, we, could, we could potentially do deep dives onto those mechanisms. Yeah, does that so answer your question, Kevin? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Um, I guess the other thing is if people wanted to get their hands on some of these plasmas, for example, um, I guess uh, uh, Nevin Krogan would be the person um, for them to contact. Absolutely. Yeah. Cro Nevin Krogan or anyone in his lab. Yes. They, uh, they're doing a, I know that they're working pretty much uh, around the clock trying to get these out to as many people as possible. And yeah, just contact them. They're, they're kind of cutting through the paperwork for you. There's no red tape they'll give you the plasmids if you want to work on it. That's fantastic. Um, 
I think it's a good segue, actually. Thanks, Fravats, for, for uh, mm -hmm. showing us your work and breaking down that, that really uh, interesting um, uh, set of experiments that you've done here. Um, I think it's a good segue, actually, uh, to ask uh, Jared here. Um, uh, you know, maybe you can tell us, Jared, a little bit about um, how, you know, we saw this paper at Synthigo um, and maybe how we're interested in developing some things that could complement some of this work. Yeah, certainly. So this paper, essentially, it hit the bioarchives, I think, within 15 minutes. It was being passed around all the various Slack channels around Synthigo, saying like, oh, wow, look at, look at this work that they managed to put together. And what it really is a, an incredibly short amount of time when you think about the, the level of detail and the amount of work and all the bioinformatics and mass spec that needs to go into actually producing a data set like this. Um, so we were, in, we were incredibly, inc incredibly impressed by it. Um, in terms of Synthigo, you know, we, we saw these lists of druggable genes. We saw the list of here's all the genes and here's everything that's within the interactome. And we thought, you know, how can we create models for these diseases such or for these viral interactions um, that we could really start to get a better understanding of what is going on during infection, what is going on post-infection or during replication of the actual virus itself. Um, and to try to be able to support scientists that are looking to validate these kind of proteins. So whether that's through creating of knockout models um, that are targeting all these you know, it's essentially the entire interactome or everything that's within the um, viral genome, um, looking into coming up with guide RNAs that can knock these targets out or cell lines that have these, or not cell lines, but cell pools that kind of have each of these um, different proteins knocked out and supplying that and looking around and supplying that to people that are interested in studying the more mechanistic or potentially even looking at, hey, we have all these drugs in preclinical or uh, you know, up to phase three studies, um, are they actually targeting the gene of interest that we're looking at and are they going to have any sort of effect on, um, on this SARS-CoV-2? Um, so that's, that's kind of the approach that Synthigo is taking from it, is looking to supply, essentially supply researchers with different uh, modalities that they can use to try to understand and address some of these questions a little bit faster. Yeah, it's really great. Um, I, I, I guess I think, um, you know, uh, as we've started to, to reach out to people, um, you know, I probably what could be really beneficial and helpful is if, you know, we can leverage our expertise um, really to try to build um, a set of um, tools that can help people who maybe want to um, start working on some of these uh, proteins and, you know, uh, understand them in a, with a bit more uh, granularity. Um, <laughs> Granularity. Sorry, I, I, couldn't, I, couldn't, I couldn't help that part. Um, <laughs> you, you saw it coming. All right. Um, can, um, can, so f from the Synthigo perspective, it, it seems like, you know, we're, we're starting to put these things uh, in, in place, uh, in place, Jared. Um, Shravas, I wanted to go back and ask you, what, what is the next step for you in this work? Um, would you be looking to do some genome engineering to kind of um, uh, uh, study some of these um, uh, network proteins in, in more detail? Yeah. So. Um, the core focus of, of, of my lab's contribution to this going forward, I think is gonna be focused on the granules and the positive regulators of granules, which are J3P1 and two, and the negative regulators of granules, so casein kinase two. Um, so we already have constructs, which actually um, the video I showed you was of one of these constructs that force granule expression. And um, so that's kind of a positive regulator. But we the, the most interesting candidate compound that we have is silmetasertib that targets CK2. And so one of the things we're really interested in knowing is whether this negative regulator of granules is a vulnerability that could potentially be targeted. And in order to know that, we need to be able to knock it out. Um, and that's potentially one, one avenue where we could use um, the genome editing tools that Syntego has in its uh, arsenal. But that's, of course, very narrow, very focused uh, when we have the time. And then this is, of course, uh, going to be after the most acute phase of this infection response. And we have the time to go back into the lab. Uh, we will want to expand that to pretty much a very broad um, broad range of regulators of granule formation, both positive and negative. And we already have a list. We have a list that we are looking at. Um, 
Yeah, um, because this is, and I want to emphasize this, that this is kind of going to be a long-term problem. This is going to pro potentially, we're going to have to potentially deal with this again. And so uh, kind of having tools ready to go when we come out of this for the first time will be really, really crucial. Okay, great. Um, I, th I think Aditya, do we have any uh, questions from, from the audience or anything else that we wanted to, uh, to address? Yeah, with? we do actually. Um, that's a good segue. So one of the things as we're going through, um, we went through a paper, we worked together, I would say, as you guys talked about over hundred plus scientists worked to get this out in over a little over a week. Uh, one of the questions we had from the audience was, what are the key things that are wearing you during a pandemic really to your lab? I mean, you're getting all these labs working together, getting the outputs that they need. How are you guys able to function constantly um, while being remote? And what are the things that were you guys during this time? Okay. Um, so you Jared, Jared. Do you want to... Yeah, um, I can definitely try to take that one first. I mean, I think there's very much a concern about, you know, we make sure every single day that nobody's, you know, not that nobody's infected, but that nobody's displaying symptoms. And Synthico has very much established a policy of like, if you feel uncomfortable or if you have anything, um, if you have any concerns at all, please don't come into the office. Nobody, you know, nobody's being forced to be here. We're not, we're not trying to do, you know, we're not trying to make or break it that way. Um, and so it's very much, everybody is very, very concerned for each other and making sure that everybody else is very healthy. Um, and making sure that yourself is that you yourself are very healthy. Um, making sure that you take we're making sure that you take all the proper precautions. Making sure that every absolutely everything is cleaned down all the time. Um, essentially, the entire lab is on a rotating schedule of cleaning the lab two or three times a day, um, and just to make sure that we we all pitch in and try to keep each other safe. Um, I think that's really the, the been the most important thing to us. And I'm going to um, take a question in two parts. One is how are we kind of staying productive? And um, part of that relates to how like academic labs work because it's always a grad, graduate students and postdocs are by the very nature of their positions temporary. And, you know, we're always looking to do the next thing and the next thing and the next thing and make progress. Um, and often in the, in the pursuit of that, we kind of don't do as much of a deep dive into our data as we probably should. And uh, at least in my lab, what we're kind of taking this as an opportunity to go deeper rather than broader. And um, we're reanalyzing a lot of our old data sets. We are, anal we are um, analyzing data sets from other labs. We're initiating collaborations and group things with, with other groups around the country. And um, going to say something else. Oh, yeah. Um, so we, um, most of our lab is vet lab biologists, but we do have a couple of specialist bioinformaticians. The others in the lab, including myself, dabble. But hopefully, when I come out of the other side of this, uh, I'll be better at it than I was coming into this. Um, and in terms of how we, the things that concern us, obviously, Things like funding, you know, our concerns are like overarching concerns. Um, and one of the things that I know affects a lot of postdocs, not just in my lab, but around the community, is that a lot of universities are starting to uh, feel the pinch, feel the financial pinch of this. And that kind of trickles down into uh, you know, new faculty hiring, new postdoc hiring, graduate student admissions, um, staff hiring, and the effects of this are going to be long term. We don't know what those will actually look like. It doesn't stop us from worrying about it all the time. And I'm speaking in this not just on behalf of myself and our lab, but also in on a large segment of the postdoc community in general. It's uh, it's concerning, but we just get through this day by day. Yeah, that's definitely a good attitude to have, that things will change drastically, but as Jared said, we want to make sure we're safe and um, making sure others are safe around us and knowing that things will change, but taking it day by day. So we have a great comment um, 
slash thought from Laura Lambert. Uh, she says, I run a transgen transgenetic rodent production facility. Our animal care staff is also greatly reduced and we are mandated to mark only 25% of our cages as priority. If our animal care facilities run out of food, all cages not marked will be euthanized. This was really hard for us because we have hundreds of cages and our ability to resume production will be impacted if that happens. What do you guys have thoughts on that, Kevin, uh, as well as Jared and Srivats? Yeah, I mean, I, it's it's a really tough situation. And, you know, I think it just goes to show that, like, you know, there, there are many different facets to doing uh, biological research. One of them is importantly having uh, things like a road and production facility so you can build you can use models for um for your research um and you know i i think maybe you know some of us are maybe forgetting all of the um uh, the infrastructure that's required to do research and um you know if we're scaling back um you know people that can go into the lab um and people that can work in these facilities and run these facilities then that's obviously going to have like a downstream effect on on lots of research projects um and, you know, uh, literally it's going to impact when we come back, um, you know, the ability of people to, to, to further their work the way that they need to. Yeah, I would agree with Kevin. I mean, I think that's a really great point is that a lot of times we don't see all the infrastructure that goes into actually running and maintaining labs. Um, and so, you know, depending on how long this may be, I think it was brought up last time about how we may be in shelter in place for two or three months, but it's going to be five or six months worth of work to really try to bring everything back up to where it was before. And I think we just all need to be cognizant of that as we, as we continue through this phase. And uh, just to add on to that, I think, you know, you're going to have to, once we're on the other side of this, revise what it means to be productive. And in, in a particular time frame, because it's going to, like, like Jared and Kevin mentioned, it's going to take at least six months or probably even longer to get all these mouse colonies back up and running to uh, where they were before, before this pandemic. And so, um, yeah, productivity norms are going to have to be revised, at least for a, for a bit. So there's going to be a, a transition period and a new norm as we're talking about <laughs> in the graph. Yep. <laughs> Um, with that, we're actually excited. We want to try something new this week, and we're calling it the Cas9 Minutes. And as this is CRISPR office hours, and we're talking about genome engineering, we want to spend nine minutes doing rapid fire responses to any questions you have on CRISPR, genome editing, and obviously Cas9 or any of the Cases. So feel free to jump in and put your questions in. We'll answer them uh, as quickly as possible. And to get started, we actually had a question come in, uh, and this was, can you tell us about some of the advances in prime editing and other editing methods like CAS-13 and how they're being applied to COVID-19 research? Um, yeah, I, can I mean, I can take at least the, the CAS-13 one is very, very interesting, obviously, because it's an RNA targeting um, you know, RNA guided RNA targeting. Uh, I think there's a lot of work going into which one is going to be best, as in, is it going to be Cas13a, Cas13d are both uh, possibilities that people have used, um, and both have their pros and cons. So I think that the groups doing research there, and there's, there's some really fantastic groups that are looking at them, um, but looking to see, you know, how can it be best used as a therapeutic and how it can we best deliver these potentially, um, I think it's a very exciting field. And I think it's, it definitely shows a lot of potential for what the CRISPR field is. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll agree. There was, um, you know, a couple of fantastic papers out. One last year from um, part of Sebedi and, and Feng Zhang, the, the Carver approach to use um, Cas13 nucleases to target viruses in cells. Um, and then just recently, uh, Stanley Key's group at, at Stanford University showing the what they call the Pac-Man approach. I've got to love the acronyms. <laughs> um, all, an acronym. Exactly. Um, sh showing, sh showing a similar type um, approach to use Cas13 cas 13 d to uh, target um, viruses inside cells. So, you know, it, it, I think that's a really interesting, um, uh, really interesting advance and neat way to think about using um, a, a CRISPR uh, nuclease in vivo. Um, and then just, you know, on, on the prime editing, um, you know, obviously this, this was the talk of the town, you know, about six months ago when David Liu first announced this. Um, again, it's a, a, a fantastic piece of technology and shows a lot of promise. Um, you know, and I think uh, right now we're, a lot of scientists are kind of going through this period where they're trying to evaluate this technology and, and get it to op 
be more optimized and work um, most efficiently in their hands. So, um, yeah, no, I, I, uh, that's going to be, you know, a really interesting play to see how Prime works out because, as you know, um, you can utilize uh, a reverse transcriptase in conjunction um, with, um, you know, uh, a, a single uh, strand cutting um, Cas9 nuclease, um, basically just to create a flap and then come in and do um, a form of HDR, if you will, to generate things like single nucleotide variants and certain gene tags and things like this. So, um, yeah, it's that, it has the potential to be really transformative. Okay, cool. Um, so we have a question from Vidya Ram Prakash. Can CRISPR be applied to early cancer diagnosis, particularly in dissecting tumor DNA? Uh, from someone who's you know not in that particular arm of the CRISPR field, but just you know from reading around, I know there's at least two groups that have been working on this. One is uh, Sherlock Biosciences out of that that kind of butted out of Fung's lab and the other being Mammoth, which is pretty local to here out of uh, Jennifer Doudna's lab. But do you guys probably have more of an idea of the progress they've been making? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure um, how much they are focused on, on doing things like detecting uh, tumor DNA. Um, uh, we actually may be able to get um, a couple of those groups onto CRISPR office hours in the near future, so stay tuned. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I think, um, I think it's a really interesting application, um, you know, especially if, you know, those, both of those, um, both of those assays, um, you know, both claim that they have, you know, high levels of sensitivity. So uh, being able to detect, you know, just very minute amounts of tumor DNA um, in like a liquid biopsy would be um, extremely powerful. Um, you know, we, we've heard, we've heard of people trying to do this type of thing before. So we obviously we have to be guarded. Um, but uh, I think, um, I, I, I don't see a reason why it couldn't be. Cool. Any other thoughts there, Jared? Or no, I mean essentially it's it's just as those two were saying. Um, I think there's definitely a potential for it, um, especially in the diagnostic route. It's using cell-free DNA or taking liquid biopsies would obviously be the way to do it for early detection. Um, and with the, the massive multiplexing capabilities of CRISPR or using orthogonal type vectors, um, I think there's definitely a possibility for it, but I, I think it's still a little bit down the road. Okay, it looks like we have one more question. Should we uh, get to that, Aditya? Yeah, there we go. Came in at last time. First time to do CRISPR slash CAS KI with floral tagging suggestions. Is the viral strategy the best one? Suggestions for enhancing the efficiency of SDR pathways. This is from Christina Zolo. Uh, okay. So, yeah. yeah. Can I take a few things? This can I, I can mention a few things that have worked for me in a non systematic way. Um, so, one is. One of the things that's really worked for me is um, asymmetric homology arms of the knock-in construct. And um, this is kind of based off of a paper that came out of Jacob Korn's lab, I think in 2016 or 2017. Um, I can put in the reference into the chat box later if you guys want. But um, the, the homology arms being different lengths either side of the cut side um, really seems to improve the editing efficiency or knock-in efficiency by a lot. The fact that you're using a floor tag also helps because you can sort things. Um, there's a couple of um, there's a couple of reports about cell cycle inhibit inhibitors helping uh, knock-in efficiency, like nocodazole specifically, and that you might also give a try. I've tried all of these for different applications and they've worked to different degrees. Um, you know, there's no one size fits all. Again, it's it's more art than science. Yeah. Jared, do you want to talk a little bit about this? <laughs> yeah, just to build in all over that. Um, KIs are difficult and are very highly variable based off of cell type, which of course nobody really wants to hear, um, but just kind of the way it is. We've had pretty good success using a couple of the small molecules, most notably, um, I believe, M3814, which was a paper published um, recently using iPSCs and uh, 
had a, had a high efficiency of knock-ins to that locus. Um, so that, that would be my biggest one. I've, I've also experimented a little bit with the cell, essentially using nocodazole um, to try to synchronize everything. The results can be a little bit mixed. Um, the, one of the biggest ones I would make sure, I mean, one of the big, one of the, I would optimize it without actually doing the knock-in first. Make sure that you're actually getting high levels of editing independent of the KI um, because everything else after that point can just be obfuscating what the actual data is. Um, so that'd be, that'd be my number one recommendation. Um, I would, viral strategies always are a little bit, um, a little bit worrisome to me because you of the limited amount of control that you can actually have with the viral strategies. Um, if it's the only way that you can get it in, go for it. Uh, but I would definitely go for sort of the, the oligo based approach first. Yeah, I, th I think it's really going to depend on uh, the cell type that you're using. Uh, Jared mentioned iPSCs. There's a great um, methods paper from uh, Bill Scarns' lab at JAX that showed uh, that you could use some of these non-homologous end joining inhibitors um, in conjunction with uh, things like cold shock of your cells to um, decrease the amount of NHEGA repair um, mm -hmm. and favor HDR. Um, there are modifications you can use on the oligos that you're incorporating. Um, you know, of course, there are, there are many groups that are using an AAV approach um, to do HDR um, for their knock-ins, um, particularly in um, therapeutic cell types like hematopoietic stem cells. Um, Matt Porteous at Stanford's a great example of that. He's really pioneered that field. So I, I think it really depends what your application is, um, but feel free to, to reach out to us. Um, if you've got some more questions, maybe we can clear some things up for you. Um, uh, there should be an email you can uh, reach out to or just put your email in chat and we'll, we'll contact you and we can have a, a, a meteor discussion, if you will. Yeah, yeah we can def definitely figure out what exactly the pra uh, parameters are with that. I will say one of the things that Bill Scarns, I believe, showed too is that um, you know, a lot of times the, the amounts of things that you're using, so essentially the ratios of guide to cast to um, whatever your donor DNA um, can make a big difference as well. All right, well, um, thanks everyone for participating in, in the cast nine minutes. Hopefully we got to a few interesting questions. Um, uh, and thanks uh, everyone to, to you all out there for listening today and a, a special thank you to our guests, um, Shravats and also uh, Jared. Thank you so much for your time. So hopefully this has really been an informative CRISPR office hours uh, this week. And uh, I'll let uh, Aditya uh, wrap it up here. Yeah, thanks uh, to all our panelists and our attendees. Um, thank you, Shivas, Jared, for taking the time. And as always, Kevin, it's a pleasure hosting with you. So real quick, this recording will be available on our YouTube channel. Uh, you can watch it there. And our next broadcast will be on Thursday, April 16th at 9 a.m. And we'll be talking about the transition period. We have a pretty cool guest uh, coming on for that as a panelist. So we're really excited about that. You'll hear more about um, that in the coming few days here as, you're, as we roll out invites. And as always, if you're interested in being a panelist or if you have any questions, please send them in to me, av at synthigo.com. And, or you can fill them for the next office hours. That being said, thank you. And we hope you have a good rest of the week.